Welcome to Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. My guest today is Scott Ritter, and Scott will, and I will be talking about the Chinese balloon that uh, uh, went over the United States. So, Scott, your version of what happened and what they're saying on TV was diametrically opposed. What's your view on the balloon? Well, first of all, <clears throat> I, I think it's imperative that we understand that um, American airspace is uh, inviolable. It's uh, part of our sovereignty, and um, you, you just can't simply fly things over our territory willy-nilly. It's not uh, acceptable. It's not acceptable for us to fly over Chinese territory, and it's not acceptable for them to fly things over our territory. So we have every right to be concerned about this. But we also have to... Um, you know, mitigate this concern with um, a realistic appreciation of what exactly is happening here. Okay. Um, you know, if 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 I were driving home in a snowstorm and I pulled into the wrong garage, uh, the wrong driveway, uh, thinking it was my house, and I, you know, did he pop up to the door and open the door and walk in? Am I breaking and entering for burglary, or did I make a mistake? Um, you know, and 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 so you know, we're trying to paint this as China somehow launching an attack on America with this balloon. That it's spying. It, we're calling it a potential a delivery system for uh, a, a nuclear device, the electromagnetic impulse weapon that can, um, you know, basically blind American radars and everything like that. Um, and then we treat it as uh, as a military attack. I mean, as the balloon left American airspace, meaning it's no longer a threat to us, and it's pretty much the balloon that held hostage by the jet stream. It's going to go where it's going to go, and it's going to lead away from there. We then attacked it with an F twenty two fire fighter firing a uh, you know modern air to air missiles. Um, so we engaged in a, an act of war against uh, this object. We treated it as a a, a military attack on American soil. Um, did we have the right to shoot it down? Yes, we did. We had the right. Just like if I bebopped into your house in the middle of the night thinking it's my house, um, if, if you thought I was a burglar, maybe you could shoot me and say, he broke into my house. Well, yeah, but I didn't really. I sort of accidentally strolled in there and, uh, you know, it was an accident. The Chinese, this balloon, I don't believe the Chinese planned to put this balloon over the United States. There's no reason for them to do this. Everybody's talking about Chinese trolling. The Chinese are out there trolling. You know, China is a um, actually a mature nation. A, a newsflash to America: it's a it's a real country, a real country. It has a government that's very serious and very good at what it does. Um, if you don't think so, why don't we do this? You go to the New York subway system, ride around it for a little while, and then get on Amtrak and go anywhere you want in America. Film it, and then fly to to to, to China. Um, and go on the Chinese subway system and then get on the Chinese high-speed rail system anywhere you want to go in China and film it. And then come back, drink a couple beers, drink a glass of wine, and play the, the, the images side by side and tell me who's doing a better job. All right? The Chinese aren't amateurs. These aren't a bunch of children. They're not little, you know, they're not playing theatrical one-upsmanship games. It's a serious country doing serious business around the world better than we do. Now, what is the purpose of the balloon? The Chinese claim that it's for, um, you know, civilian research related to climate change. And if you take a look at the history of China, I actually did. They've been floating, uh, you know, balloons up in the sky, collecting uh, critical climato clim climato climatological data. Uh, <laughs> big words, Marines shouldn't use multiple syllables, but uh, yeah. <laughs> They're collecting climate-related data, <laughs> and uh, you know about particles, water particles, things like that. Um, and they've been floating these balloons for a long time. If the balloon, the, you know, they have tethered balloons, and then they have untethered balloons. And if an untethered balloon uh, breaks communication and starts floating, once a balloon here, and here's the the news flash to you guys. Even though yes, it has propellers, even it has a rudder. And so that means it can change direction a little bit, go up and down a little bit, but it is held hostage to the jet stream. Once it goes that way, it can't come back this way. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone. Um, and maybe 
the system has an internal self-correction system. You know, like when you float, uh, when we fly a drone, if a drone breaks contact with its control station, it then will go into a pattern seeking to make new contact. So it will go into an automatic default mode looking to make contact. So when you're trying to explain what this balloon is doing, because people are saying it showed evidence of maneuverability. Yeah, I think what was going on is its internal system was saying, lost contact, contact, turn. But the, the jet stream, moving. break, move, turn, break, move. Oh, yeah, and it brought it over some areas that were of concern to us. But people who think that you're going to use a balloon to take photographs of, a, um, of American silos, what camera system do you think is on that thing? Um, it's, remember, it's a balloon in right. the jet stream being moved by wind. So you would need a gyro stabilized platform uh, mm -hmm. that weighs a lot. It's expensive. So let's say you have that. Now you're taking the imagery. Are you going to store that imagery on a disk? Well, how are you going to get it? The balloon just sort of floating over everywhere. How are you going to get it? Or is that going to transmit the data to a satellite and then bounce it off and bring it back to China? Wait a minute, let's back this up for a second. Transmit the data to a satellite. Why would you send it to a satellite when the satellite can take a better picture of anything the balloon can take a picture of? And the Chinese have satellites in geosynchronous orbit over the United States taking photographs of everything. This whole concept that this is an intelligence collection platform is stupid, ignorant, dumb. The only thing China was able to collect over uh, the American territory was, again, meteorological data at high altitude, which, if we were smart, we would have asked them to share because it could give us insights into global warming, which we all claim we're concerned about. We shot the darn thing down. I mean, this is literally stupidity. And this is because we are... The American people are conditioned to view everything about China in a negative fashion. We're not allowed to assume innocence. We're not allowed to assume normalcy. We can only assume that the Chinese are nothing but a bunch of yellow slant-eyed plotters sitting in Beijing going, hong, 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 hong. I mean, it's a cartoon caricature of it. And it's insulting to Chinese, probably as insulting as my imitation was. Um, and I don't mean to insult him. I'm just showing you how stupid Americans are, that this is what we think. Um, you know, could the Chinese have done a better job of communicating? Well, let me, again, they probably did. I will bet you a dime to a dollar that they made multiple phone calls to their American counterparts saying, we lost a balloon. The balloon's floating. It's a civilian research balloon. But see, we, we can't believe them because we just assume that that's nefarious intent. They are claiming to have lost the balloon, but we see the balloon maneuvering. Therefore, we believe the balloon's under control. Well, hey, guys, why didn't you take one of our wonderful intelligence collection platforms and fly it alongside like a, I don't know, an RC-135? It, it's an electronic and a signals collection platform. Fly it alongside the balloon and collect the signals coming to and from it and determine what those signals are. Is it receiving instructions about maneuvering? The answer is no. Is it transmitting data? The answer is no. Is anything happening in that balloon? Yeah, um, there's a, a, a beacon sending out saying, find me, find me, find me. But it's a beacon with limited range and duration, limited power, because it is a balloon that can't carry a lot of weight. This is literally the dumbest thing ever. This is much ado about nothing. But now what we've done is further strain already tenuous diplomatic relations between the United States and China. You know, why aren't the American people demanding that the FBI make public everything they found in the wreckage? Why are we allowing it to be hidden behind a wall of secrecy? You know, people are talking about the intelligence community. Ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you about the intelligence community. They're not very good. They're not very good at what they do, because especially when they have to assess things they don't know anything about. Mm -hmm. This balloon took them by surprise. How do we know that? Because apparently, uh, when we started looking at the data, people went back in history and went, holy cow, it looks like three of these balloons actually uh, flew over our, our territory before. And we had no idea, no idea which means we weren't tracking these balloons, which means we didn't have analysts who were focused on what these balloons are. So now we had to reverse engineer it and we have to go back and say, uh-huh, it's out of, uh, you know, 
uh, Hainan Island and, and all that. So now you have intelligence analysts trying to breathe life into old imagery and trying to assess from a million miles away, 10 years distant, what was going on. And they are prejudiced by assumptions made by politicians that it is nefarious. So you must interpret nefarious intent in everything. This is what we do as an intelligence community. Um, you should have good analysts who aren't infected with political bias, but not anymore. You don't get promoted in the intelligence community unless you kowtow to political bias. So now the intelligence community is telling the political people what they want to hear. The last thing you want is a Scott Ritter coming up and saying, no boss, it's an innocent civilian balloon. That's not a message they wanna hear. And I wouldn't be allowed to make that presentation at the White House. My career oriented counterpart will say, no, 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 boss, this is evil intent. We determined that this is a bad balloon, bad balloon. And they go, oh, you get to go brief the president now. That's how it works, ladies and gentlemen. The intelligence community is fundamentally corrupted from an integrity standpoint. Their analysis is almost always politically slanted, therefore always politically wrong. So don't tell me, well, the intelligence community says this. I don't buy that. Excuse me. I didn't mean to upset you. <laughs> so have you have you been following this story on the news and what what's your opinion of what's being said well the news again with with very few exceptions is buying into the government narrative as the news does with everything the government does i mean the the mainstream media is nothing more than a stenographer for the government so when the government wants to put out a message the the mainstream media will repeat that message so the if you're watching the news, the primary message you're getting is what the government is saying. On the periphery, there might be some alternative points of view, but those are buried in, you know, the, the 56th paragraph, uh, you know, 13 lines in, um, where somebody says, well, it may just be a civilian balloon. But then almost immediately you get an expert opinion that's four paragraphs long that says, no, we deem it not to be civilian for this reason, and this reason, and this reason. Um, don't trust the mainstream media. Don't. Wow. And have you, you, have you always felt like this about the mainstream media? I mean, you were on the, on the uh, mainstream media all the time back in the early 2000s, right? Well, in, in the late 1990s, too. Well, I avoided the media like the plague while I was um, on active duty. I was an intelligence officer, so I can't speak to the media. I mean, every once in a while when I was an inspector in the Soviet Union, I was pulled aside to do the media event where we would go and talk to reporters about what happened in Vodkin. So if you Google my name, you might find a couple of stories and say, well, you spoke to the media then. Yeah, I was in a very controlled environment. I wasn't there providing unfettered analysis. Um, that only happened after I left the United Nations Special Commission. But what I learned while I was in the United Nations, what I learned, what I learned during the Gulf War, what I learned during as an inspector is... Well, again, I can just provide a couple quick examples. As an inspector, uh, you know, if, with the INF Treaty, responsible for monitoring SS-20 missile production at, uh, at Vodkins to make sure they weren't producing it, uh, the Defense Intelligence Agency, which was uh, opposed at, at many levels to this treaty uh, because they believed the Soviets were cheating, uh, they were actively leaking to the mainstream media a figure of 200 missiles that were being held by the Soviets that were unaccounted for. So the DIA was leaking intelligence information, highly classified intelligence information to the media using a guy named Bill Gertz, who was writing for uh, the, 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 the Washington Times, I believe it was. Um, but, you know, and so he would write these articles that are derived from top secret classified documents saying the Russians are cheating because the U.S. intelligence community says there's 200 missiles. Well, I was the inspector on the ground in the Soviet Union at the factory that produced the missiles. And after doing what I do, um, I was able to reverse engineer the, the uh, manufacturing process and come up and say, uh, the most they can do, because I did the timings of the trains moving from point A to point B, did the measurements, uh, looked at the buildings, looked at the incoming flow, looked at the outcoming flow. There was a lot of work done. I didn't just guess. And I came out and I said, 60 to 80 missiles a year is maximum production. That's it. Norm is 60, they could up it to 80. They can't go much higher than that because the plant simply doesn't have the capacity to do that. Um, well, gosh, this changed everything. Uh, and and the, the, so the CIA, I wrote a report for the CIA and the CIA put that report into the overall database, which all analysts now draw upon. And what happened is 
the people who were detractors of that, when they couldn't intimidate me into backing down, started leaking information to the press to be magnified by Jesse Helms in the United States Senate about cheating, cheating, cheating. It was all lies, all lies. But I'm sitting there going, why is the press doing this? This isn't reporting. They are simply receiving bad information and then trying to treat it as good information for political purposes. So very early in my career, I saw this. During the Gulf War, I saw the same thing when it came to the Patriot missile performance and our ability to destroy Scud missiles. I knew because I was on the inside, and when I say inside, I mean the inside, General Schwarzkopf's staff in the bunker with access to everything. I knew we weren't shooting down a single Scud missile with the Patriot. But that's not the message that the government was giving media. We were that Raytheon Patriot missile was brilliant, shooting down every Scud Buster, Scud Buster. It was all lies put out for political war. And the same thing about destroying Scud missiles before they could launch against Israel. We didn't destroy a single one. And yet we were telling the press that we were destroying everything because politically we had to convince Israel that we could destroy the missiles to keep Israel out of war. It was all a lie. When I worked for the Special Commission as a weapons inspector, you know, again, not bragging, but almost every major confrontation between the United Nations and uh, and Iraq that that could lead to war was an inspection that I led. So I was the center of the storm uh, on a continuous basis, which means that when the Security Council met in emergency session, I was the center of attention. They were talking about my issues, the ones that I briefed national governments on, about inspection teams that I led, I conceived. I knew everything about it. I was there in the meetings when they talked about it. And yet, the American diplomat would sneak out the back near the end and go to his New York Times source and talk and spin it. And the next day, there would be a headline story about that meeting discussing what I was doing and it was spinning it completely wrong, lies. So I knew from the very beginning it was a lie. Then I worked for NBC News when I came out. I was in the newsroom working. I was, Tom Brokaw loved me. And he was the big man at NBC. And so I would be there. I'd have access to Tom. I, I, I was on his newscasts. Um, but I saw as the, the news reports came in, they would come to me and say, okay, you're the Iraq guy. I'd say, okay, this is what it means. This is what's happening, da, da, da. Then I'd watch Tom Brokaw read the news that night, and it's 180 degrees different because I received a phone call from the White House to change it. Um, I was fired from NBC News because I was confronting Sandy Berger with his lies. And basically, Sandy Berger told NBC News, fire him or you no longer have access to the uh, Sunday White House room. So I got fired. So I know it's all a lie. I worked for Fox News. Within a couple months, Fox News stopped putting me on air because my message was inconvenient. But they didn't cancel my contract, which meant that for the remaining four months of the contract, I couldn't go on air. It was designed to silence me. I know it's I've gotten known from day one that there's collusion between the government and media. But the way you defeat that is by always telling the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. But sadly, there's no one out there that's willing to do that today that's on the inside. Um, but, you know, that's just a sad state of affairs. Mm -hmm. So you, you're working on a number of projects. How are they going? Oh, well, I mean, now that I can focus on them, uh, we had a little bit of drama <laughs> the last couple of weeks over, uh, you know, a, uh, a, a, a anti-war rally that's uh, taking place next week. Uh, but uh, that drama, um, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is, is, is past and then now we're just I'm, I'm moving on and uh everything's going well everything's going very well i should say extraordinarily well would you like to discuss it or do you want to save it for another time i think it would be premature to discuss it at this point in time because as the past week has shown i have a lot of enemies out there and right. um i'm just not going to basically tee a ball up and let them take a swing at it uh i'll let things uh solidify i'll let things become um, irreversibly uh, grounded, and uh, and then we could talk about it. But right now, to talk about things would be uh, to expose potential weaknesses that, that allow these enemies to uh, to disrupt. And, and they've shown a proclivity to try and destroy me and uh, destroy what I'm trying to accomplish. So I'm just not going to make it easy for them. They got to work for it. <laughs> and how's your book coming? Books come on very well. I mean, it's resonating quite well. I think people are catching on to the message. The message is becoming attractive, not only here in the United States, but abroad. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm very proud of the book. And um, as I told the publisher when I wrote it, I said, this isn't a book that's going to be published and then go away. 
this is a book that's going to be around for a long time, irrelevant for a long time, because it's not dependent upon current affairs, meaning that I didn't write about current affairs. Because if you write about current affairs, it's a great book for about you know three, four months, but then the whole story changes. People are trying to tell me, Scott, you got to write a book about the war. And I remember there's heavy pressure on me to do a quick book in, uh, in August. They were like, you got to write it. You got to write it. It's got to be published. And I said, guys, this is stupid because I'm going to turn this book over to you and your production timelines are such as going to take you two weeks to do this, three weeks to get it out there. And I said, you're going to publish it in September. And I make the following promise. The war will be completely different in September than it is the way I write it. I can't tell you how it's going to be different, but it's going to be completely different. So you can put a lot of time and effort to put a book out that will be outdated and useless the moment it's, it's printed. And sure enough, in September, Ukraine launched its major offensive that changed the whole, whole dynamic of the war. That's why I did. You know, but my book, Disarming the Time of Perestroika, isn't because it's a, it's a work of history. It's already happened. Mm-hmm. I encapsulated it. What makes it valuable is the example it sets for what we need to do going forward. So it's a it's, it's not just a work of history, it's a template for the future that will never change. That template will be valid now, six months from now, a year from now, two years from now. So this book has legs and this is a campaign, uh, not a battle. A lot of books you go out there and you're fighting a battle to take advantage of this limited window of relevance. This book is gonna be relevant for a decade. So how can people get it? Well, you can get the book. Um, Clarity Press is the publisher. Uh, you can go to claritypress.com. Uh, or if you want to help me out, you can go to scottritterextra.com. Because when you buy the book there, yes, you go to it, Clarity will ship it. But we get a little something there. Um, when I say a little something, it's a little something. So the only way it actually works is if a lot of people buy the books. And then that little turns into maybe I get to buy a hamburger. But um, that's that. And there's another feature, too. I think uh, a lot of people have been talking about autographed books. Uh, and so we now have a, a, a way that if somebody wants an autographed book, you can actually go. It's going to cost you more um, because of shipping and, and all that. You have to buy the book. You have to pay for the shipping. You have to pay for the handling. Then you have to pay a little, again, a little uh, you know, fee that makes it worthwhile for us. But um, I think for 50 bucks, you... Um, you'll get an autographed book at your doorstep if you live in the United States. Uh, it, we haven't figured out how we're going to do it in Europe because <laughs> I've been sending books to Europe because I'm an idiot uh, and I don't understand business. Um, I've been sending books to Europe um, and it cost me $49 in postage to send it. And that's a sunk loss. I don't get that back. And so I, I not only don't make any money off the book, I lose. I have to sell three books to pay for <laughs> the cost of shipping one book to Europe. So we don't know how to make that work in Europe, but in the United States, if you go to scottritterextra.com, you can um, you can order an autographed book if you want to. Great. So Scott, you're a busy person and, you know, I'm going to keep my eye on what's going on, you know, in the news and I'll be contacting you again for your, your uh, comments about you know, current events and so forth. So if any final thoughts before we say goodbye for the day? Well, I just want to thank you for all you do for, um, again, not not just for me. I mean, it's selfish, of course, for me to thank you. I mean, it's, you know, of course I'm going to thank you because you're, 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 you're helping me out. But I'm thanking you for the service you provide to the community. I think you are an invaluable resource and, um, you know, not just about, you know, the interactions with me, but any interaction you do with anybody, I think uh, you 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 provide a unique kind of journalism that hopefully will get the attention it deserves. I love doing this because, you know, I schedule a, uh, a Zoom meeting and then I put it on my YouTube channel and I get to talk to the best people and it's a lot of fun and I make new friends. I mean, you can't go wrong doing that, right? Can't go wrong doing that. Make make new friends and help influence people in a positive way. So uh, I applaud you for what you're doing. And I thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Scott Ritter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. This is Issues That Matter. And if you like this show, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you, everybody. And have a great day.